Wow. What a crowd. Yes, from all around the world. So amazing <laughs> to hear all these stories. <laughs> And what an honor to be here kicking off the show for all of you tonight. Itasha, I'm especially excited to be talking with you Likewise. because last year at MIT Technology Review, we recognized your company, 12, on our list of 15 climate tech companies to watch. So we've been keeping up with your progress. And tonight we're going to talk about what you've done since then, raised a lot of money, and what's next for 12. But first, let's start at the beginning. So Itasha, can you just tell us, why do we need a new way to produce jet fuel? Clearly we need to reduce emissions from aviation, but why not use biofuels or electrify all these airplanes and have them run on renewable electricity? Yeah, I love that question. Because at the heart of it is like, why transform carbon? Why continue to use the same molecules that we use already? And there's really three reasons for that. So one, to go to electric flight, we would have to retrofit and redesign every single current aircraft that we have. And that's a huge endeavor and will take a lot of time. And for our, secondly, we want to do this now. We have a feeling of urgency of wanting to decarbonize a very hard to decarbonize industry, which is aviation. And so right now, our fuel, which we delivered our first set of fuel under a U.S. Air Force contract in 2021. That fuel could be dropped in immediately into an airplane. It already had regulation no clearance, and we could immediately decarb flight up to, and reduce emissions by up to 90%. So that speed and urgency is there when, when you ask the question, like, what if instead of electrifying the plane, you can instead electrify the fuel? And third, we see hydrocarbon fuels as fuels for the long haul. When I think about this optimistic future where we have cleaned up our atmosphere, our grandchildren are waking up and they're going to school and they're ordering their flying car, a flying taxi, you know, and one family is getting in that, in that car and flying to school or to work, I see that car, that short haul, small vehicle, as being electric. But when that family wants to come to Lisbon and wants to come and congregate as we are today and fly cross country with 200 passengers, they're going to need fuel for the long haul. And that fuel is going to be liquid hydrocarbons. Unless we can change the laws of physics, we know that liquid hydrocarbons are the most energy dense fuel out there, and we need that for long haul flight. And with biofuels, biofuels are great. They have paved the way for sustainable aviation flight in general. Um, but it really comes down to resources. So with our fuel, we can use up to 500 times less land and up to 100 times less water to make a fuel that can, again, decarbonize flight up to 90% per gallon. Wow. So how did you arrive at this idea that air itself could be transformed into jet fuel as well as so many other kinds of chemicals? Yeah, when I was a grad student at Stanford University alongside my co-founder, Dr. Kendra Kuhl, we were reading about work from a professor in Japan. So professor, professor Yoshio Hori, he was one of the first professors to, to take a, a, a bottle of club soda, so CO2 dissolved in water, and he put two metal strips in that club soda mix, and he applied electrical energy. And he saw bubbles coming off of that metal strip, and he tested the, those bubbles and, and saw that that gas was a, with two hydrocarbon molecules. And throughout the course of his work, he, he identified up to four or five molecules that could be made from just putting those two strips of metal into that club soda. So when I was in graduate school, we said, can we use more modern equipment and engineer those metal strips to produce even more molecules? And we did that. So we identified up to 16 new molecules that we could make by, again, just putting two metal strips into club soda, applying electrical energy. And each one of these molecules represents a multi-billion dollar industry. And we make those molecules currently from petroleum. So we just asked the question, like, if we can make these molecules from CO2 at scale, can we start to grow our economy, make these materials and chemicals that we use and love, but have a lower carbon footprint while we're doing it? 
And so we decided to start a company after graduate school when I needed to get a real job after, <laughs> after graduate school, so we, we did that. And what made you decide that that was the right time to begin a company that, as you say it now, focuses on what you're calling carbon transformation? Timing is everything with a startup, so why did that feel like the right time for you? Yeah, well, there are two things. One, you know, the, the prime minister kind of touched on this. This, like, I think you mentioned the, the science triangle. Well, we saw this kind of golden opportunity of technology and policy and demand. Like, people were wanting to do something about climate while growing the economy and, and, and looking at carbon as a more expansive molecule, one that we, again, if we can use CO2 and make these materials, we can expand our economy instead of contracting. The second thing was that we got into a program at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab is in the hills in Berkeley, California. And we were surrounded by scientists and equipment such as you know, uh, sophisticated tech, um, uh, spectroscopy equipment, sophisticated imaging, sophisticated gas analysis. And we started to take our, our work that we had done in graduate school and start to build a reactor that could scale. And one of our first lessons we realized was that uh, carbon dioxide is a very stubborn molecule. Uh, we could not get any significant results in those first even few hundred experiments that we did. And I remember there was one moment right before the Christmas holidays when we were saying, okay, we've done all these experiments and the lab is about to shut down for two weeks. What are we gonna do? And there was literally two factions. There was like team uh, Christmas, as I'll call them, who wanted to just do a Hail Mary run, like combine all of our ideas together, go to the extremes of the recipes and just do one run that would go over Christmas. And there was kind of team go home, who was like, let's just go home and like figure it out in the new year. And so team Christmas won out and we did our first experiment. And for the first time, it was almost, it almost felt like a miracle where we were able to get our first long-term, stable, and non-trivial amount of carbon dioxide converted. And so from there, I realized that we had something now where we could scale this molecule, we could transform it into something that could become the materials and chemicals that we use and love, many of which are in this room, from the chairs to building materials to even fuels that brought us here. All of these materials are carbon-based and we can make them with CO2. So you're taking CO2, you're taking carbon dioxide and water and electricity and turning it all into all these different kinds of chemicals inside of that reactor. Mm -hmm. So it sounds a bit like magic, but tell us what's going on in there. What does that actual process uh, look like and how does it work? Yeah, well that magic happens every day and around us. So in a lot of ways we are mimicking trees and plants. So trees take carbon dioxide from the water, from the air, they take water from the air as well as from the ground and they use sunlight to break down the CO2 and water molecule into smaller atomic bits and reform those atomic bits into sugars that they use for their own growth and development, and then they emit oxygen. And we do the exact same thing. It said we use metal catalyst and electricity to break down the CO2 and water molecule into smaller atomic bits and then reform those atomic bits into new hydrocarbon molecules, and we also release oxygen as well. So in every way, we are, we are looking to do industrial photosynthesis and scale up this technology so that we can have industrial forests that are out there doing the work of trees. And you can see here on the slide that, again, it's just that CO2 water and molecule with electricity. And in the foreground, you'll see our, what we could, you could call like a black leaf. So it does the work of leaves on trees, but uh, we've made these electrodes that can do that work and then we can make an array of different molecules. That's so fascinating. So how much water and renewable electricity will you need to power these reactors as you scale up production of jet fuels? And give us a sense, is the grid today anywhere close to being able to deliver that? Yeah, absolutely, great question. So we, in a lot of ways, our, our plants at scale will consume about the same amount of energy as a data center. So as we're building this world where we have uh, digital bits that are moving around for AI and other you know, digital purposes, we can also build alongside these 
air plants or these industrial forests that move molecules and move carbon atoms so that we can create a sustainable world. And our first commercial plant that we're building is in Moses Lake, Washington. That one is a subscale version of our larger commercial plants. And it'll do about 100 cross-country flights worth of fuel in a year. And our larger commercial at scale plants will do upwards of 10,000 flights per year. These are cross-country, 200 passenger flights that we can produce. And again, you're looking at the same energy uses about a data center. So hundreds of megawatts of, you know, a utility scale solar, utility scale wind that would support that. And we do use the grid electricity as well to uh, power our plants, but it ultimately is coming from these renewable sources. Interesting. What other scientific or engineering challenges will your team have to solve in order to succeed at this? Or is that no longer a problem and it's all about <laughs> scaling up production and lowering costs from here on out? Well, it's all of the above. We definitely have some uh, engineering challenges to get to scale. And we've already solved some of our engineering challenges. So we started off with an electro that was the size of a postage stamp. And over the course of four iterations, we've grown that electrode to something that's the size of a desktop monitor. And so each one of those iterations, each time we increase the size of the electrode, we had to re-optimize the recipe, we had to run a series of tests and make sure we didn't have any defects in how we were manufacturing the electrode at that larger scale. And now we're taking those, that electrode that's at scale now, and we're, we're stacking it up, and then we take the stack and we put it into a system. So we have the valves and the pumps and the piping that surrounds the stack. And imagine thinking of something that's like a shipping container size system that has a series of stacks and has the, the piping and everything contained within it. So now that's the area that we're, we're innovating and we're um, doing this engineering optimization to be able to build those shipping containers and then deploy them out into what we call air plants. So at each point, we're optimizing for cost, we're optimizing for manufacturing yield, we're optimizing so that we can be you know, as low cost as possible, because that's the way we're gonna really be able to have it such that every single flight can have sustainable aviation fuel in the future. So lots more work to do, it sounds like, but you've just raised almost $650 million. Yes. So tell us how you're gonna spend that money, <laughs> what is that gonna go toward, and what will 12 be focused on? Yeah, absolutely. Raising uh, $645 million was a huge milestone and a huge signal that we were going in the right direction. And just thinking about, you know, that time when we were at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and now we were here where we're getting signals from the private sector, not just the public uh, sector. And so, you know, that funding is a bit unique. It's not just all coming to the company as, as corporate equity. It is a uh, climate stack, as we call it. So a large portion of it will go to project financing, so project equity. So when we deploy and deliver our large air plants, that funding will be drawn down in, as we meet several milestones. So as we you know, make the design, we complete design, as we secure the land, as we start to build. And so we'll use that funding to have project equity. There was also project debt that was in there. And so, you know, debt is the way in which a lot of renewables have come to scale, so solar and wind. Right now, you can finance that um, mostly with project debt. And so it's really important signal for us to know that we can get debt in addition to uh, project equity as we start to build out our, our plants. And really, you know, we're building more than just a company. We're really building an industry. You know, power to liquids or, or making electrofuels or e-jet is really, you know, there's a ton of volume there. There's a lot of scaling that we need to do. And so we need to think about just beyond our first plant, even our, beyond our second plant, and really think about our first 10 plants. And so that financing will be part of that capital stack that will help us get all the way to 10 plants and then even beyond that so that we can build an industry of sustainable aviation flight. And so far, we've talked mostly about jet fuel, but you've also been in discussions with potential partners about collaborations for all kinds of consumer products. So what can you tell us about those conversations and what other products might be coming down the line? 
Yeah, absolutely. So in addition to making jet fuel, we make a hydrocarbon blend that can become materials and other industrial chemicals. And so, and we've, we've made some materials at a subscale. So we made uh, lenses in sunglasses with Tangaya. We made a component in Tide detergent with Procter & Gamble. And we made a car part with Mercedes-Benz. And so we're really excited about our ability to make all of these materials that we use and love that support our lifestyle, uh, making them from the air instead of making them from Petro. And for our first plant that we're building in Moses Lake, Washington, that plant will support a at-scale uh, customer engagement, which we're currently discussing and under contract, but we're really excited about going to a much larger scale and having a much larger presence in consumer products, such that you, know, you can buy a product. Again, it's the same materials. It's the same you know, uh, compound that you would love and use, but instead of it coming from petroleum, you can have it come from CO2. And CO2 Made is the, the brand that we're, we're building for those materials. And how else might this technology be used in the future? You mentioned to me possible applications in outer space. So tell me more about that. How could this evolve from here? Yeah, so on Mars, over 95% of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. And they've shown that there's water there too in subsurface areas. So we see a world in which you could have a small colony on Mars and use our technology to mine the atmosphere for CO2, use water that's from the subsurface, and again, make all of those materials and even rocket fuel to have people come back. And you can make all of that while you're on Mars, so you don't have to transport the molecules from Earth to Mars or, or even the moon. There's um, some sightings of CO2 and water there, and you could have the same effect, same technology to, to build out these materials. And, even beyond that on Earth, like we're, which is our current focus, um, we want to see a world in which all of us can take flights and continue the lifestyle that we love. We can grow the economy, we can create jobs, and we can lower our carbon footprint at the same time. And so, you know, we hope to create a world where you can go and you can, you can purchase the products that you already use, and instead of purchasing something that is made from oil, as nearly 96% of the materials we use right now are made from oil. Instead, you could um, get it made from air and made from CO2, the CO2 made. So we, you know, building toward that world and we can't wait until our grandkids and all of our uh, great grandkids can live in a world where they can say, wow, I remember those first few moments when we were looking to create an industry creating sustainable aviation fuel, and building a world that's clean. That's all we have time for. I've learned so much. I hope you did as well. Thank you, Natasha, for being here. Looking forward to following yeah. your progress.